Rise of that one State. That is when Vancouver Canuck fans started to know Michael Furlan, or as Kevin Bexa referred to him, Michael Furklin. Welcome to Agree or Disagree the Podcast. My name is Kevin Olenek. You can follow me, of course, on Twitter at K-E-V-O-L-E. Find me on Facebook, Kevin Olenek. Like Agree or Disagree the Podcast on Facebook. And subscribe to all podcasts on wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, the big story in Vancouver Canuck land is that Michael Furland signed a four-year, $14 million contract uh, today. Again, in the midst of quiet and in the midst of uh, a quiet summer offseason where nothing is going on, the Vancouver Canucks find a way to make some news during the, this offseason. And... It seems like Vancouver Canuck news is year-round news now. Of course, remember last year where Trevor Linden stepped down at the end of July. Uh, now we got this story as well this year. So the Canucks continue to make news year-round. Uh, as far, of course, let's uh, of course uh, uh, we'll be reacting to the Michael Furland signing. Uh, talking about that, uh, Beardy Canuck 03, Sean is not able to join, but you can always follow him, Beardy Canuck 03. Tyler, also not able to join, but you can find him at T Noble on Twitter, and Heidi at Heidi Amaze Balls on Twitter as well, as she probably will be talking something about something stampedish or uh, talking hockey as well. So follow those three, but they're not able to join today. Uh, this is just me by myself, and I think in order to kind of look at this signing, we have to look at the person that Michael Furlan is. And of course, uh, Eric Francis did an article a couple of years ago on Michael Furlan and his battles with uh, alcoholism and alcohol and and dealing with that. Um, If you remember in that 2015 playoff series between the Calgary Flames and Vancouver Canucks, it was the Eddie Lack's dad versus the Michael Furlan's mom show as they would continuously uh, show pictures of both of them in the crowd. So it was uh, quite a fascinating uh, little uh, uh, difference and exchange between the two two families there. Um, but Furlan went through a lot, and um, he uh, certainly has, has been an interesting player over the years. And, of course, uh, last season was traded from Calgary to Carolina, in last year's draft, him and Dougie Hamilton goes to go to Carolina for Elias in Lindholm and Noah Hannafin. Uh, Ferland that season scored uh, 20 goals. Uh, last season, he scored 17 with Carolina. Uh, he is a uh, going to be an, a, a signing here, according to Cap Friendly. He has a no-movement call, clause and 3.5 throughout the entire contract. So next year... Year after, 21-22, 22-23, $3.5 million. Uh, a guy that you will have as a top six forward. Now, one of the things that uh, Jim Benning has was wanting to acquire and improve, and he certainly has done that, not only with Michael Furland, of course, the JT Miller trade as well. Uh, 20, uh, uh, 27 years old, 6'1", 217 pounds. Um, and it's an interesting case of Michael Furlan, um, because this is a guy that can score goals. He scores goals as, at a streaky level, and sometimes he scores goals. Um, he certainly was a big impact when he was on the line with, with Sean Monahan and Johnny Goodrell with the Flames, and he seemed to be the guy that fit best in that position. But when he was not in that position he did seem to struggle a little bit in terms of offense. And of course, if you play with good players, you're going to get more goals. That's just the way that he is. That is. Um, 
but he is a guy that I think can provide a physical presence in, during, in the game. And, uh, you know, as Beardy Canuck 03, as Sean tweeted, they brought him in for his forechecking presence. Um, he is a man that can get do that very well. He is a man that battles along the boards very well. And is a guy that I think would fit very well with playing with Elias Pettersson and Brock Besser. I don't know how well he would play with Bo Horvat, but I don't think it would be that terrible to see a line of Bo Horvat, Tanner Pearson, and Michael Furlan. Um, I think that this is a guy that overall um, I think will be productive. I am curious how this fan base will handle his streaky scoring. Because it is streaky. And certainly the first half of his years, uh, if season's last couple, he's done well. But of course, in the second half, he has struggled. He's, he struggled scoring goals, scored one goal in the last 17 games for Carolina. Struggled to score goals the last 35 games against Calgary two seasons ago. Two goals in 35 games a lot two seasons ago. No goals in 17, final 17 regular season games. He's a, he's a good, he, as I said, streaky store, score, great start, not been great at, his, at finishing the season. So that is something that I think the Vancouver Canucks are going to have to work with. And this is something that the Vancouver Canucks are going to have as a talking point throughout the year because of his, his streaky scoring. I think that this will be an interesting conversation, especially when you look at how they talk about other players. Uh, when you talk about uh, Louis Erickson and Sutter, and I'm not comparing Furlan to Erickson or Sutter necessarily, but I do wonder how the streaky scoring part is going to fit with this Vancouver Canuck fan base. And I think you'll get off a good start. I do think that the fans will generally like Michael Furlan. I feel like Michael Furlan is a lot like Alex Burroughs in the sense of a guy that has had to overcome obstacles to get to where he is. I, I see a little very similar traits between Michael Furling and Alex Burroughs. I'm not necessarily saying that they're the same player. I think that they're different styles of player. But I can see that similar relationship that Alex Burroughs had with the Canucks fan base that Michael Furland will have with the Canucks fan base. As I said, we talked a little bit about the lines here. We talked about where we could see him playing. I can see him being a really good fit with Elias Pedersen and Brock Besser. Um, I think he will provide offense there. I think he can drive, play, and do good forechecking with Bull Horvat and Tanner Pearson. But if he's on the third or fourth line, I don't think it's going to be easy to expect a lot of offense for him. Um, but... Um, and as a, at that point, I wonder what he is going to do. So that's my curiosity there. And of course, the other issue that has come up here has been about the salary cap. And of course, all summer, there has been talk about Louis Erickson and Brandon Sutter and all of what's going to happen. Um, Louis Erickson's agent, J.P. Berry, has said that they are open to the options of discussion Louis Erickson being on other teams, they are, uh, it sounds like him and the Vancouver Canucks are in discussions going forward with that. So I could imagine that that will be something that they could happen going forward. Of course, you have the Brandon Sutter question. And this has all gone down to what the salary cap is, because at this point with the Vancouver Canucks, the salary cap, according to cap friendly at this point in the this is something that is the flow is going is is not exact, but there's some flow here. So we'll we'll go through this. Cap space as of this point is five over a little bit over five million dollars. You do have the, uh, the option, of course, of putting Antoine Roussel on a long term injured reserve, so that can break break some moves there, bring some things over. You have the question of Sven Berchi um, as well, Tim Schaller. Another option, and Adam got at, and it's entirely possible that all three of them could be in Utica. Now, Berchi, Cam Robinson talked about this on Twitter. Uh, Berchi is an interesting trade option because I see he's a guy that can score twenty goals and forty points. 
uh, 20, 40 to 50 points. He is a, certainly a talented guy. He has the ability to be a top six forward. But he also has a history of concussions and a history of injuries that could turn some teams away. But he's certainly an option that could be moved. And it's an, also an interesting option and an interesting idea that you could put Berchi down in Utica if he can't move him. You could also put Louis Erickson down in Utica. It, he's, it would cost a little, it wouldn't be, you wouldn't hide his entire salary. You can hide some of his salary. Uh, Tim Schaller, if you cannot move him, can't start in Utica as well. So there is options in terms of salary cap that this is not necessarily as uh, as bad as that looks. And when we look at the four-year, $14 million contract, I know that there's some people like J.D. Burke talking about how this is a bit too high. It's one of those things that it, this is a negotiation. It's not accounting where you can only just go at a certain route and this is all. There's much more that I think that goes into it than being so stringent as to say, well, I'm sorry, $3 million is too high. I'm going to take a walk. There are other teams that are more competitive in this. I believe, in, it's my opinion, I don't know, but I would imagine a team like the Las Vegas Golden Knights might have been interested in a guy like Michael Furlan. Quite possible. Who knows? Uh, there was talk Calgary was into it. I don't know if either of those teams have necessarily the salary cap option to do this. But there's, there was talk and some interest. And most teams looked like they were going on the three-year route. And you have to sometimes negotiate or over-negotiate. And one more year, you may not like. It may not be great. You would rather have Michael Furlan on a three-year contract. But sometimes that's not as easy as we want to make that out to be. Maybe it would have been three years and you would have had to have paid five or six million dollars. We don't know that. We were not in the negotiation room to say what happened there. So this might have been the more economical option to make sure that they have a guy like Michael Furlan in their lineup and have a, not have another team have. We don't know. So uh, we'll have to see that going forward. Of course, this does create the glut of forwards. We talked about the options here of Erickson, Berchi, and Schaller, uh, and of course, Chris Tanev and on defense as well, but making some moves to shed salary or open some doors, which is probably one of the next steps here. And that's what I think I imagine the next six weeks before training camp is going to be a lot about. Where is Louis Erickson going? Where's Brandon Setter going? What do you do with Chris Tanev? Things like that. Uh, can we count on Chris Tanev during the year? Uh, can we count on Brandon Sutter during the year? Can we count on, we, like, what what is there to be expected here? Um, what's the trade value for these guys? And, and so that will be something we'll have to watch throughout the off season here. And we'll continue to walk up on that. Certainly a glut of forwards, a lot of interesting questions that I think go forward here. But I think if you look at the Vancouver Canucks overall, I think that they're certainly, the question is, is, is I think they're a competitive playoff team. They've certainly improved their forward. They have improved their defense. They look like, on paper, a much better team. It's just going to be a matter of seeing how everything fits together. And... You know, how other teams are doing. I think there's certainly some teams that have taken a step back. Fair to say the San Jose Sharks have taken a step back. I think the Ducks are going to still struggle. I don't know what's going to happen in Edmonton. Um, The Calgary Flames may take a step back. The Golden Knights will be interesting. Um, It's quite likely, though, when you look at the Pacific Division, that only compare to the Central, that only three teams can make it will make it in the playoffs, and five teams from the Central might. The Dallas Stars have certainly improved, or have gotten older, depending on your perspective. Winnipeg has taken a step back, probably, with the loss of Tyler Myers and the loss of Jacob Truda. Uh, Chicago seems to be making some moves up. you got St. Louis as the Stanley Cup champions. So there's some still some things to... to sort out here but I certainly the question the simple answer is the Vancouver Canucks have improved they are a better team I think that they're going to be a bigger heavier team to play against 
uh, with Miller and Furlan. I think that these kind of, kind of guys will allow forwards like Pedersen and Besser to play a more creative game, to play, uh, not that they're not creative, but it gives them room to continue to do that. Allows Bor Horvat to do his thing. So I think overall, you look at the Vancouver Canucks forward-wise defensively, I think Tyler Myers is an absolute upgrade. Where he fits, how long he plays, that's another question. I think Jordy Ben, how he plays, where he fits, is an upgrade. So there's certainly a better team. There's certainly... I think a step closer to the playoffs, I think it's just going to be a matter of where everything fits and what happens during the rest of this season. We still have a number of uh, free agents to sign and a number of unrestricted free or restricted free agents to sign. And of course, the other one that we, that we should continue to talk about here quickly is talk about Brock Besser. And of course, that has not been done yet. We, what the word is that both sides are talking, according to Rick Dollywell. Uh, but nothing has been done yet. But I do believe, in terms of the salary structure, that they have a plan of where they think Brock Besser will fit. And that plan, I think that they have thought about that as they have signed Michael Furland. So I would anticipate that they're probably a bit more ahead of the game than I think people are giving them an option. I certainly think I hope, I would hope that that would be the case. Um, but I think that you've already have a budget for probably at Brock Besser at a six or seven million dollars, maybe not much more than that. I can't imagine. So um, this, that's what it looks like. What do you think? I'm curious what Flames fans think. Well, how are you going to react as Michael Furlan wears the Vancouver Canucks colors? And what are the Vancouver Canucks fans going to think about Michael Furlan? Let us know in the comments on Twitter, on uh, Facebook. Uh, again, follow me, KBOLE, for the hockey stuff. And, of course, Beardy Canuck 03, T Noble, Hi to Maze Balls. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. We will talk to you all soon. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.